This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in our series special, The Normal Christian Life. We are in lesson two where we'll continue to look at fellowship and move into another subject from there. Now before we begin, let's make sure that we apply what we've learned recently about being in fellowship, that we confess our known sins. At the same time, we're going to allow the Spirit to control us by giving ourselves over to Him. That is another subject we'll be getting into soon. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege and opportunity and everything you provided so we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open, ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at our chart. That seems to be a very helpful tool on this subject. Again, the top circle is portraying our eternal relationship with God, where we are in Christ or union with Christ. That's what the U slash C represents. At the same time, we are still on earth where we have our temporal fellowship with the Lord. When we walk in the light, we remain in fellowship. When we step into sin, we move into darkness and we're out of fellowship. I keep it this way so it'll just be simple. There's more technical details to this. I can discuss them later or other places as I've done. But right now, let's just keep it this way and understand you need to make sure that you deal with your sin. Now, in our last lesson, we started our passage in 1 John 1, chapter 1, where the Apostle John does a concentrated study on the subject of fellowship. Remember the background again. Some of those in his churches had left his flock and went to other groups who were ignoring some of the basic teachings of Scripture. John will refute all these teachings with Scripture and in doing so deepens one's understanding of fellowship. Let's first of all just look at uh, the passage that we've studied so far. I'll put it back on the board and read through it rather quickly, get us warmed up. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and our hands have touched concerning the word of life. This, of course, refers to Christ. The apostles were with Jesus. They saw him. They heard him. They touched him. Two, and the life was revealed. And we have seen and we testify and we proclaim to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. That's the same subject. Christ is the eternal life revealed to them. He had been with the Father as the second member of the Trinity. He was sent to become the God-man. The virgin birth of Mary, he became man and lived on earth as the God-man. Continues his testimony in verse 3. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have, listen to this, fellowship with us. That's John, his companions, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So he's inviting them to come back to be in fellowship with not only them, the fellowship of the church, but with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, where they share a temporal fellowship with the Lord and the Father. He goes on to say, These things be right so that our joy may be made complete. The next verse brings out a fundamental principle that we need to understand. It's taught throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. The subject is God is light. It comes out in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Darkness portrays sin. Light is sinlessness. God wraps himself in light, Psalm 104.2. He dwells in unapproachable light. 1 Timothy 6.16 Light is the place of purity and truth. It is the realm of fellowship with God. 
It is where the growing believer seeks to be. Now, related to that is a subject of works. We've talked about works um, earlier, our first lesson. What does light do regarding works? Well, it exposes works for what they really are. Religious do-goodism, or is it genuine good works done in the light? Let's look at these next two verses. We'll look at two of them together so you can see more precisely what I'm talking about. Where people often get confused is someone does something great. They save a baby's life. They run to save someone in a fire. They jump in the lake to save someone from drowning and they say, God really enjoyed that. He appreciates that work. Well, the work is for mankind. It is done in the uh, energy of the flesh. It is not evil, don't misunderstand, not even sin, but it is not the good works that God wants from us. Now, as a Christian and the power of the Spirit, you might do all those same things. That's different. That qualifies it to be a good work on behalf of mankind for God because you're doing God's will. An unbeliever cannot do God's will no matter how good it is. Now, you say, what do you mean he can't do God's will? Well, let's, let's make sure we understand this. An unbeliever can be moral. He can be basically good, faithful to his spouse. He's not of a bad character, and that is good. And that is good of the human race. And that individual is going according to God's rules, we might say, for the human race to exist, uh, I should say coexist among each other. And that is good. That's not bad. However, it is not divine good. Divine good can only be done in the power of the Spirit. Now we'll look at some verses on this. Let's go to John 3, 20 and 21. We'll read those together and look at the contrast and we'll pick them apart a little bit. John, this is the Gospel, 3, 20 and 21. For everyone who does worthless deeds hate the light and does not come to the light so that their deeds will not be exposed. Now, this is worthless deeds. Now, <clears throat> in particular, uh, we can divide this up as well between unbeliever and believer. Believer who does not do it in the energy of the, the spirit, does it in the energy of the flesh for whatever reason, selfish reasons, to make some money. Uh, he wants to continue up his deception, continue his approval from others so he says he did something he didn't do. These are sins, of course, but even if you were to do something with that kind of attitude, you get in the area of worthless deeds. And they do not want those deeds exposed for what they really are. So they will stay away from the light. They will stay away from truth. They will not want to hear what I'm saying right now. You mean I spent all my life going to that church and doing this and doing that, and I was doing it in the flesh? Yes. Well, how can you say that? That's what the Bible says. Now look at verse 21. This is a contrast to the worthless deeds. But he who practices the truth comes to the light or in order that his deeds might be manifested as done in God. Back to worthless deeds for a moment. We'll keep both scriptures up there. Worthless deeds do not count towards anything for the Christian. It would be the wood, hay, or straw burned at the judgment. 1 Corinthians 5.12 This is why religious do-gooders run from truth because they do not want their deeds exposed for what they really are. Now let's get into our heads a little bit. Let me, let me get into your head. Um, believe me, I've, the Word of God gets into my head a lot and does some conviction on these things and I have to re-examine myself as well. So let's do that a little bit. You're offered the opportunity to do um, let's say something that's very generous. Would you like to give to this orphanage? 
Well, the Bible teaches we're supposed to care for the orphans. But what if you are not walking with the Lord? What if you're walking in sin? See, there's the, that's the problem. And you say, well, then I would never be doing anything good because I'm always walking in darkness to some degree. You know how you sometimes have those light switches where you can adjust the, the dimness or brightness of it? A lot of people like to have that dimmer there so they can kind of darken things and still do good. It is still in darkness. Let's make this clear. And they say, well, how can, be God, how can God be so strict? He's not being strict. He's being generous. He's saying, you want reward? Walk in the power of the Spirit. Now, that's our next big subject. Walk in truth, the way it's put here. Practice the truth. Do it in the power of the Spirit while you're in fellowship, and you will produce tremendous reward compared to the pat on the back you'll get on earth. So these opportunities that we have on earth to do good, when you're in fellowship, when you're doing it right, it's a good deed. It is not wood, hay, and straw. It is gold, silver, precious stones. So again, religious do-gooders run from the truth because they do not want their deeds exposed for what they really are. In other words, they don't want to admit well, they're fornicating on the side. Or they're pulling a little from the top at work. Or they've been deceiving uh, the wife and kids for a long time. Or something else is going on. But boy, out in front of everybody, they sure look good. You know how they like to make those giant checks so people can see how much someone gives? That's kind of what they're doing with themselves. They're putting themselves out there to say, this is how good I am. So people can say, well, that's a good old boy, or that's a good person. Now, we're talking about Christians here. <clears throat> we expect the world to do that. That's all they can do. The only approval they're going to get is from the world. Same with religious people. They get approved from other by other religious people, or particularly their denomination. Oh, they're so wonderful. Look what they're doing. Uh, they're running the entire baseball league so people can have fellowship on the baseball field. Really? Not a lot of growth there, but this is a type of thing that is regular. Regularly going on in religious churches. Now, what often happens is <clears throat> those who are in their, their worthless deeds, they want to settle in their do-goodism, and their religious way of life. That's where they enjoy and they have their fun. In fact, that's what they like about that church. They have so many youth programs and they have things for adults, uh, married couples, divorced couples, people straining, people with this problem, with that problem. Oh, and the singles, oh my goodness. Older singles, younger singles. Uh, maybe they have marriage counselors. I'm not saying this stuff is not okay to have, but if it's not done in fellowship, living by the power of the Spirit, and again, we'll get into that again, then it is, as the top line says, worthless deeds. God, here's where we get in your head, God wants you to do it His way while in fellowship and in His power. Now again, verse 21, but he who practices the truth comes to the light. If you're into the truth, you'll be wanting to stay in the light. You want your deeds manifested as done in God. And your thinking is, look what God enabled me to do. He gave me the opportunity, the time, the health, the education, perhaps the business, to be in whatever it may be, but God was in it as you live by the truth. Now, this is one of the primary ways the believer grows spiritually and draws closer to the Lord through practicing the truth. Let me get the verse back up there again. You're practicing the truth. This is something you do constantly. Don't miss this. 
Am I, am I practicing the truth right now? Are you? When you get done here, will you practice the truth? Will you do what's right? Will you be honest? Will you be obedient? When you're practicing the truth, you don't mind what you did being exposed. You see? Now, again, religious people don't want to hear this because they've just spent 40 years of their life being religious thinking that was the right thing to do. They don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear your opinion. And that's the way they are comfortable. They don't want to be convicted of sin. This is why a Bible teaching preacher can go into a new church, which I've done a few times, and before you know it, everyone's turning on you because you're not with their program. You're not teaching what they want to hear, and you're teaching the Bible. And so they don't even show up for Bible studies. What do they do? They get together, and pretty soon you have a little conspiracy going to get someone in they can be comfortable with. That goes on constantly. That's why you'll find churches jumping from pastor to pastor. I should say pastor jumping from church to church. That is not the way it's supposed to be. Now, related to this, talking about the light, God is light. Being in the light is also following Jesus. John 8, 12. Again, the gospel John 8, 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness. Notice this. He who follows me will never walk in darkness. That's fellowship. But will have the light of life. He will live that Christian life in truth. This is practicing the truth again. Look at these underlined words again. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You have eternal life. You can have that strong, abundant, temporal life as long as you stay out of darkness. Condition, you've got to follow him. Now, that brings us back to our First John passage, verse 5. One, first John 1, 5. Again, look at the underlined words. This is a message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So John uses light for God to emphasize God's purity, the total lack of darkness, which means the total lack of sin. The obvious implication is that if you want to have fellowship with God, then you cannot be living in darkness. Now, folks, this isn't hard. In fact, you sit back and look at this and says, wow, this is really simple stuff. Yes, it is. There's no reason for this to be hard. Darkness, light. Sin, sinlessness. Get out of the light and then we'll see what we're supposed to do here in detail in a moment. So the main premise we need to understand, the truth from John, which John will now work, is God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. This is our main principle. You want to know God? You want to walk with God? you got to be in the light. So this leads us into the subject of fellowship and developing that concept by John, who has been combating false teachers, robbing from his churches um, the sheep. John is going to give us ways we can test whether one has fellowship with God or not. Now, here's an argument you'll often get from people, and you'll see these arguments. Well, I have fellowship with God all the time. I feel it. I know I do. Do they live in sin? Then they're deceiving themselves. These are the type of things John is going to address here. This is something those straying, immature believers need to hear. 
so they can reject the false teaching they're being fed. Now I'm talking about John's audience who got away from him. John will do this very logical way by stating three false claims people make about themselves. You'll even hear some of these today. Then he'll do a quick rebuttal after each claim, then a reasoned counterclaim. So get this. He'll, he'll state the false claim. He'll quickly say where that's wrong and then do a reasoned counterclaim. Now, let me just show you this. You, at least you can get the pattern, whether you remember this or not. He gives the false claims in these verses, verses 6, 8, and 10, with the rebuttal. And then he gives the true, what's true, what you should be doing, and the counterclaims in verses 7, 9, and chapter 2, verse 1. So let's break down the first one. Verse 6. Remember, you're going to go to false claim, rebuttal, then true counterclaims. Verse 6 is the false claim and rebuttal. If we say that we have fellowship with him and are walking in the darkness, we already understand this, right? We lie and do not practice the truth. I'm going to break this down now to um, what I described. So here's the first false claim begins with if, conditional sentence. Maybe you'll do this, maybe you won't. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we're living in darkness. Living in darkness, of course, is a life characterized by sin. Then comes the rebuttal. It is, we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay? Then comes the counterclaim. Let me put this whole chart up here. I think I can do that without most of it will be on the board. Maybe all of it. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so here comes the counterclaim, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This adds an additional thing we haven't talked about too much. But note again the if. You still have to choose to do it. You have to continually choose, in fact, and walk as in the present tense. You have to keep on walking. So as we have fellowship with God in the light, notice what else happens. The blood of Christ cleanses us, keeps us cleansed before him. We have been saved. We've been cleansed. We stay in the fellowship. We're good. Let's put it that way. This is the truth we've we have to understand and constantly apply in our lives. The work of Christ on the cross is the basis for which we are forgiven and cleansed from sin. Make it simple. You're either in the light or in the darkness right now. You're either having fellowship right now or not. You can't follow Jesus if you are in darkness. You can't have fellowship with God if you are not in the light. Now, some of you out there might be thinking right now, I have never been taught this before. I think at the same time when you ask that question, you begin to you can answer that in part on your own. People don't know it. People don't want to know it. People don't want to do it. It's not a popular teaching, and yet, and yet it's essential to be in fellowship with God. Verse 8 gives us the second false claim with the rebuttal. Let me just put it all up there together again. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now this adds an interesting element. So here we are, if again, maybe we will, maybe we won't. If we say that we have no sin, if you're one of those that say, well, I don't even sin anymore, I'm a Christian. And people do say that. You say, well, that sounds pretty crazy. Yes, it does. There are people who believe that. And they think that they're walking around, never sinning. In fact, they're just being self-righteous. Um, this is the Pharisee type of thinking. 
do it our way and you're okay. But yet they were full of sin and self-righteousness and do-goodism. So again, the second false claim, if we say that we have no sin and then the rebuttal, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now give this thought, give this some thought for a moment. Deceiving ourselves is self-deception. It's living in the illusion that you are something you are not or doing something you're not. If you think you don't sin, you're deceiving yourself. Now, this is a frightening position because not only are you living in sin, in error, in darkness, but you don't know you are. Then you see no need or desire to get out or repent or confess. As long as false teachers are telling you this is normal or good or don't tell you about it, there's no reason in your mind to get out of sin or, as we've studied here, walk in fellowship because you're good. You're doing fine. Now listen, this is the way cults and religion works. They deceive you into thinking that you're the normal one and everyone else is messed up. Notice the rebuttal. Let me just put that up there by itself. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. John identifies with his readers. So it makes it hypothetical at the same time, which we know it is because we saw the if. But when they say, when it says, let me put it this way, when it says here, the truth is not in us, this is a complete absence of biblical truth in the hearts and minds of these people on these matters. They really do not know what they are doing. They are deceived. The counterclaim. Here's a statement of truth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess, present active subjunctive, maybe you will, but it's also in a present tense. If we keep on confessing, when necessary, you confess. You may find it necessary to confess several times a day. You may be in a situation where you're so fired up and angry, you're having a difficult time confessing it and staying with it. You just get angry again as soon as they open their mouths. Talk about the word confessing for a moment. The word is homo legao. You see the word homo, same, legao, word or speak. Basically combined together, they mean to agree or to acknowledge, to promise, to confess. You agree with someone. In this case, you're agreeing with God. That's a sin. This is the acknowledgement that you have sinned to God. It is admission or declaration that one is guilty of sin. Notice in our verse, let's go back to it for a moment. It says, to cleanse us, no, let's back up further, to forgive us our sins, and the plural. This is personal sins, known sins. We confess our individual, personal, and known sins. How do we do this? Very simple. If you lie, you go to God in prayer and say, Father, I lied. You do this knowing that if it was a sin and you were guilty of it, this is turning away from that sin and turning towards God, we call that repentance. So you know it's a sin, you're guilty of it, you confess it, you turn away from it, that's repentance. In other words, you don't sit there and do it and then do it and then do it, do it, confess, do it, confess, do it, confess. That kind of vicious cycle, that doesn't help you do anything. You confess it, forget it, Move on, confess it, let it be forgiven, then you forget it, and move on, okay? 
Unless there's something you need to straighten out with someone, perhaps you uh, misled them. You want to go back and say, hey, wait, I, I told you wrong. Don't make a big deal out of it. Now, if it was a critical thing you said, like it just made your company lose half a million dollars, well, yeah, it's, and then you may be reluctant to straighten it out, but you want to be right with God? You may lose your job. Yep, that happens. Whatever it may be, sometimes it's a judgment call. It's, there's a time to straighten it out, for example. There's a way to do it. But if you do not go back and straighten it out when it needs to be, and you'll know, then you become guilty of deception. That's a sin too. That needs to be confessed. Now listen, it doesn't require anything else. Thank God that we don't have to sacrifice animals. What a bloody mess that was, literally. But today, since Christ has already been the sacrifice, he has shed his blood, all that's required of us is to confess it. You don't even have to feel guilty. Uh, you don't have to cry over it or weep over it or feel bad about it, though you might, but it's not required. Now, this is not to say that some of these feelings may be accompanying some confession, but it's not required, and it's certainly not to be worked up. Oh, woe is me, woe is me. Certainly not penance or penance or making up for it. When you do this, the Father, as it says, let's put our verse back up. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. Notice and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When it says he's faithful and righteous, these are permanent eternal characteristics of God. This is his essence. This is part of who he is. He cannot, listen to this, God cannot be unfaithful or unrighteous. He will do it because in his plan, he sent his son to pay for it. It's paid for, buddy. Move on. He's faithful, totally loyal. He'll always do it. Never fails to forgive. He's righteous, perfectly righteous. It is the perfectly right thing for God to do to forgive us our sins based on the work of Christ on the cross. That is why Christ died, so we can be forgiven. You know, we often lack application. God never does. He did not send his own son to the cross to die for nothing. It's paid for. He not only will forgive it, he has to forgive it. Why? He said he would. To put it simple, forgiveness always comes based on God's character. You can see where religion comes in here. Yeah, we confess our sins, but then we have to do penance. We have to make up for it, you know, um, and I'm not real familiar with the Catholic Church, but we got to say 10 Hail Marys and do this or that and genuflex here and do that. And that's just silly. You're adding to God's forgiveness? You can't. Continue in our verse. So he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. That means to cancel pardon. It's over with. Now, folks, that's great news. Yeah, you may feel bad about it. You may still carry some guilt, but you don't need to. You don't need to carry guilt because that's taken care, to, that's taken, taken care of as well. Notice the next line. And to cleanse us. Same word in verse 7 for what the blood of Christ does. It means to purify, make one free of, listen, guilt. It means to purify, to make one free of guilt. If you still feel guilty about it, you need to confess. You need to confess that too. If you truly confessed it, it is 
over with. Nothing to feel guilty about. God does not need your help forgiving you for your sin. That cleansing is, notice, from all unrighteousness. That includes all sin, all kinds. Your mental sins, uh, your lust, your bitterness, your jealousy, your sins of the tongue, your lying, your uh, somehow deceiving people with your tongue, you state the wrong amount, whatever it may be. You accuse somebody falsely and your overt sins, the actual uh, uh, doing the sin itself. Whether, whatever you have to confess, you actually did steal it, okay? Romans 1.18 and 2.8, we are instantly purified from all sin and its filth. You have a clean slate, you're back in the light, you're in fellowship. Now, many wonder about what if it's an unknown sin that you've committed? Well, first of all, you can't confess an unknown sin. Why? Because you don't know what it is. But rest assured, it's forgiven too. Once your attitude turns back to God and you want to cleanse yourself through confession, and I say cleanse yourself, that is through God's cleansing of you, you yourself make the decision to have yourself cleansed. That's what I mean by that. You choose to do it, God will respond. All unrighteous means all your sin, including your unknown sin, is cleansed. When you have the attitude of coming before God and coming clean, so to speak, you are cleansed and forgiven. Needless to say, this is very important to remember. The blood of Jesus Christ his work completely cleanses you. You have no reason to think you are not completely and totally forgiven and perfectly cleansed. I'm going to read that again. The blood of Jesus Christ, his work completely cleanses you. You have no reason to think you are not completely and totally forgiven and perfectly cleansed. When we confess our sins, God always forgives us and cleanses us. John is making it clear. You can confess those sins and God will immediately forgive and cleanse you of these sins. Now let me add this before we continue on. If you have studied the Bible long, you know that sin, like the devil, is very sneaky. Sin can come with a bad attitude towards someone. Suddenly you get bitter. You didn't like the way she talked to you in front of others, or you felt insulted or degraded. Sin can come with a bad attitude towards someone. It can be resentment, jealousy, come with a small lie, a little deception, and these can add up and you find yourself unhappy with a bad attitude, angry, and you also know as a Christian, something's not right with you. Confess what you know is a sin or what you might think is a sin, just to make sure. And let the Lord clean it up, clean you up. The point is that we need to constantly examine ourselves, making sure that we are walking in the light in case there's any sin or sins we need to confess. 1 Corinthians um, 11 28. I believe that's regarding communion. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Do not let your list of unconfessed sins grow. Otherwise, you're in the danger of letting it get the momentum in your life and gain greater control over you, making it more difficult to make the turn back. You become less and less interested in Bible study, the truth, and even doing the right thing. If this continues on, this can lead to the danger of apostasy and falling away from the faith. So, 
the advantage of keeping short accounts. Confess daily and often just to make sure you're walking in the light. That's one reason I have prayer before every Bible study. At least you'll be reminded to confess, well, however often you study these video series. To put it another way, if you cannot think of all those sins, don't worry about it. Confess what you remember. If one happens to pop up later on in your mind, confess it again. Or confess it for the first time. Tell God you don't remember them all. That's fine. If you've just started confessing for the first time in years, wow. God doesn't expect you to go back and review your lifetime. Some will come to your mind, the really big ones, where you really mess things up. Confess them. God will be with you. He knows you don't remember everything. But remember this. He's your Heavenly Father. And, and He will treat you as a child. And He knows you don't remember everything. But He knows your heart as well. He knows your intention. And He will forgive you those sins you forgot. So don't sit there and try to review your life. Just get in the mode of confession Turn back to God and begin to do the things we're learning about maintaining your fellowship. And when you get out, you confess it. The main thing is that you are turning from them and back living for God. The third claim is in verse 10. Here's the false claim. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You should be able to identify the false claim as well as the rebuttal now. If we say we have not sinned, boy, that a false claim. But there are those who believe that, as I mentioned earlier. As long as they keep doing what they're supposed to do in their religion or in their own self-righteousness, then they think they're good. Oh, I haven't sinned for a long time. I haven't read into anybody personally that says that, but I have heard people say things like that, uh, that they've heard someone say to them, so sort of secondhand. But it does happen. Uh, we make, notice this, the quick rebuttal, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, who's being made a liar? God. Look, you're born a sinner. You sin from the very beginning. Uh, before you know it, you're aware of what's right and wrong, and you're sinning intentionally as a child. And any of us who know the Scripture or are honest with ourselves know that this is to be an absurd claim. So for someone to claim this, they'd have to be way off somehow. This would be someone who says they do not need to confess because they live in the light all the time. Really? Well, that doesn't happen. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. The only person who did that was Jesus Christ. So do not be so foolish that you fall into that trap. The counterclaim goes to the next chapter. Here's the truth of the matter. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children... I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now this is a wonderful principle, especially this last half. But it begins by telling us the purpose of John's writing is to stop people from sinning. That is our goal. That is what we strive for. That's the truth of the matter. But you can never claim you have a sin, have not sinned. So get the priorities straight here. Do not sin. Then if you do, there is forgiveness. Which brings us to this counterclaim in the second half of the verse. Let me get that up there underlined. This has a lot of heart in it. Listen to this. And if anyone says, excuse me, if anyone sins, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The counterclaim comes with the assumption that they have sinned. So if you sin, all right, that's just the, the hypothetical, and believe me, you will. There's a step towards reality for these people. They finally admit they sin. For someone to think they do not sin and also shut out God's truth with no truth in them puts them in a precarious position. Now, there are some people who constantly self-justify everything they do. And in doing so, they don't think they're wrong. Well, he did that, so I did that. That's okay. I just got him back. I got her back. You see? But for someone to claim they do not sin also shuts out God's truth in their lives. They have no truth. If they still have some room for truth to get in, then they should realize that they just might sin. And when they do, they have Jesus Christ standing by the Father for their defense as their advocate. We have an advocate, capital A. The word, I'll show it to you here, parakletos, it's someone who pleads another's cause, a counsel for the defense. Who does that for us? Jesus Christ. Now you think about this. Jesus Christ is also designated as the judge for the human race when the time comes. Wouldn't it be wonderful, in fact it is the truth, to know that your judge is the one who died for you and forgave you and paid for your sins? That's true with you as a Christian. So when we come to Romans 8.34, listen to this. Who is the one who condemns? Christ, Jesus, is he who died, and more than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God. Now listen to this. Who also is interceding for us. So he's defending you. When you sin and you confess it, he can look to the Father and say, yeah, we paid for that one. I paid for that one. Father says, okay, all's clear. Isn't that great? That's grace, folks. That's your Heavenly Father's love, Jesus Christ's sacrificial love. As our advocate, Jesus Christ is described here as righteous. He's perfectly qualified to go before the righteous Father and plead our case. We should not forget that God the Father is faithful and righteous to forgive us upon confession. So both the judge, listen to this, and the lawyer do the right thing. We cannot possibly lose. Think of it. Now listen to this. Always one of my favorite lines. The Father who gave his own Son for our forgiveness is faithful and righteous to forgive us instantly. And the son who was given and shed his blood is right there defending us. His own blood. Life was given so that we can be forgiven. His life was given so we can be forgiven. God has provided everything we need to continue in fellowship with him. When we deviate, then we simply confess it. God the Father made the plan God made the provision through his son, and the son was the sacrifice, and the son makes our case before the father. In addition, our last verse in 1 John, verse 2, speaking of Jesus Christ, our advocate, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. John tells his audience, that Jesus Christ is a propitiation for our sins. Now, what's that mean? Propitiation means Jesus Christ satisfied the justice of our Holy Father. 
He did that by taking the penalty of our sin upon himself. Now, again, think of the courtroom. The father is the judge. The son is your defender. The father sent the son to die for you. Don't you think the father's going to forgive you if he sent his own son to pay the penalty? Penalty paid, you see. To put it another way, Christ did the satisfactory work to so please God and his justice and his righteousness and met that standard that God can turn away his wrath from any person who accepts the substitutionary atonement of Christ on his own behalf through faith. And then the last line tells us that Jesus Christ did this for the world. Now, if you're at a point in your life where you decided to live by one of the false claims, you have no reason to anymore. You have the truth. Now, on the other hand, if you have not confessed your sin or you don't do it regularly, you will struggle with this teaching. You'll reject it. You might even say, that can't be true. I've been wrong all my life. Yes. You'll struggle with this teaching because you have not confessed your sins as the scripture teaches. In fact, you are, listen to this, living in the darkness. Do not waste one more second out of fellowship. Confess now. We'll continue with the subject of divine discipline in our next lesson. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, the wonderful truth you have given us, the opportunity we have to walk with you, to be in fellowship with you, and the grace provision of simply confessing our sins when we sin. We thank you for these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.